part two. Children. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to first of all say thanks to Burdock for hosting us for this and for all the fans so looking after us for this as well. It's been amazing, we've had some great food. Uh, we've got some great beers which I'm going to talk about as well. And we'll talk a little bit about the European Beer Brothers Conference because that's the reason why we're over here and we saw the rain there and all the you guys that gave this beer. We just gave an all. Yeah. Exactly, so it's all good. So for the beers we have at the moment, what have we got out I uh, went with the Full Sail Pale Ale, um, the brewery, the brewmaster at Galway Bay, Chris, he's what, 23 or 24 years old, he's probably one of the youngest head brewers in Europe, uh, of any kind of craft brewery organisation, and he came in and he just literally shook the shit out of all the beers, reformulated all the recipes, and the Full Sail was the first one to get the works, it's dry hop to hell. Uh, not sure of the hop profile, but I just know that I really enjoy it when I come in here. It's never let me down. Like it's a graduate, it's a kind of a taster before you go onto the foam and fury. But I really like it. And uh, obviously, cheers to Rachel for looking after us today. She's looked after us really well again. Exactly. There, I think the uh, great thing about that beer is that it goes with so many things. It's one of those pale that I think is really dynamic in that you compare it with like spicy food, it goes great with it. In fact, spicy food loves pale ale. But cheeses with that are just amazing. Like I would normally go with a green, right here wrong, I'm like a red ale from cheese person. In some cases go for like a dark stout with some particular cheeses. But that, like I've had that just sitting there like a hand, crack a bottle, take a cheese board out, it looks really, really well. Oh, yeah, that's it. Oh yeah, it goes really well. No, no, no blue cheese, no? No. No really heavy blue cheese. No extremely smelly French cheese. Don't try that. I've tried it before. It doesn't work. Just produce some really about to your knowledge here. Funky area. stuff yeah. there. <laughs> so, uh, Carl, you actually had a couple of really interesting beers. You had the King Kong of the White Gypsy, which is a really big beer. It's got a lovely sort of which, which had to come in a large glass. That glass is almost as big as my head. Like, really? <laughs> we did take a picture. We had a picture that proves this. And it's not photoshopped. It's either I have a small head or that's just an exceptionally big glass. <laughs> I'm not beer. commenting. <laughs> <laughs> Diplomatic, I like it. Carol, this sort of brings up a really interesting point. Ireland at the moment is sort of at this point in time where, in my opinion, it's at its terrible two stage for craft beer, where it's kind of finding its feet, it's running around, flashing itself off things, it's picking itself up and doing some nice beers. Like, uh, how does this sort of measure up and sort of uh, beers you've had in the States, the King Kong of one in particular, because like this would be like a bit of a stretch for us at the moment in terms of like our profiles. This, this is this is absolutely amazing. It's it's a, a really good beer with a with some very interesting almost as they say in wine dimension and complexity. And it would absolutely compare with some of our best. Like I know they've got founders on tap downstairs from Michigan. Everybody lost in the U.S. after Founders, if you can get it. And it's got its complexity. And we've got, you know, Cigar City in Tampa. We've got, you know, 2,900 microbrews. And I'd say that one of the things that's really interesting is some of the cask beers that we don't do in the U.S. We are so into cake beers. We are, you know, getting into cans. We're going to have that discussion at the European Beer Bloggers Conference tomorrow. You know, what's better, cask versus cake versus can versus bottle? And we're still experimenting with that. But this beer in particular is extremely good. And I'd say the second one that I've got here, which I'd love to pour all over a really good Hagen dazs ice cream, is their Milk Stout, which in the U.S., one of the best Milk Stouts is out of um, Colorado, Left Hand Brewing Company oh, yeah. in yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, Left Hand's Milk Stout, this absolutely, Left Hand, watch out if... if Galway Bay comes on the scene and, and the U.S., they've got something to, to really compete. Yeah. We get our hands on left hands here, like we consider it a blessing for the most put our hands on any of us. In fact, some of the U.S. beers, we put our hands on, we're like, we can't believe our luck we've managed to find this. But like for me, that is always one of those things where 
it's a great beer even in summer. Like it's, like that should be a good beer in the summer. I like that in the summer because the chocolate is on. It takes me back to being a little kid. Where you get like a bar of chocolate as a kid in the summer. And you're well, I, all I can think of is like chocolate covered strawberries, white chocolate dipped strawberries, um, dipped raspberry. We have something in the U.S. I don't know if it's been here. We call it a chocolate fountain. Yes. Sir. Okay, they, they have it at weddings and. Yeah, we're going to get the fruit and the whole little bit. So, yeah. to have one of those chocolate fountains with fruit and have this would be amazing. And so, you know, maybe that's a new birthday party thing. Yeah, I've like, got the same thing as well as you right now. I got buried at sea. I mean, it's a really luxurious beer to me. And I always feel like I'm spoiling myself when I get a pint of it before I buy a bottle of it. But, like, I consider it like a treat. So it wouldn't be like a day beer for me, like, where it's like, an after work beer. I can see one of those beers that I'm buying it because I want to sit down a little bit. Yeah. I'm see, I, I think of it as I could be buried at sea after about 15 of these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I wouldn't yeah. complain. <laughs> Oh, we'd be a happy person. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. well, Florian, Florian, so, I think like, like, I really pulled a smart move for this. Listen, I think I have the winner. I have the winner. You do. Uh -huh. I have Stone Report by Go Away Brewery in itself. It's already an amazing beer. But I have the cast version of it. And that just put me somewhere else. It's amazing. Rookie mistake, Ian. Rookie no. mistake, you're sacked. You're there back you for the conference tomorrow. Well, I, I did find it interesting that your keg beers look the same as the London cask beers. Because it's the same labeling, the same, it looks like the same system. And yet these ones are on keg except for these two. And yes. in London, most of them seem to be on cask. And then I think that's a, it's an amazing taste. Thank you, Carol. Back Thank you, Carol. With, um, yeah, with someone actually working for White Gypsy, now it's starting a lot of cast systems. Well, yeah, um, like White, gonna... White Gypsy have been the pioneers as yeah. far as cask in Ireland has been concerned. Like, Porterhouse have always had it, but um, White Gypsy have really pushed it hard. Like, I know Declan now of Otterbank uh, is down there. He's looking after their cask installs and, and the beer making. After any cask install, probably. No, it's probably like him, there. because he, he, yeah. he is, like, the go-to guy yeah. in Ireland. He did mulligans, he did cabiners. He's done all over the place. I think it's important to note, though, that Chris, the Stormy Port recipe has only changed in the last six months. It was when they did their uh, Imperial Stout, 200 Fathoms, aged in, was it green spot or yellow spot yellow casks? Spot it's a 10% stout that you could drink five or six bottles of it and you would not think I'm after drinking 10% stouts. I'm like, this is so well balanced. It's got such, it picks up all the vanilla notes from the whiskey. It's so good. It's so limited edition that like very few people have any left. I know I have a few bottles stashed at home. But that was the foundation for the new Stormy Port recipe. They've bumped up the alcohol a bit to 5.5%, but it is absolutely barnstorming now. It's a it great is. beer. It's so well balanced, and as you were saying, like you don't feel like you get so many flavors at the same time, and you get the banana as well. Like You just get everything, but you don't... You don't feel like you're actually nearly drinking a national beer, or no. or it is. You wouldn't. You wouldn't tell. You wouldn't tell. No, what, what percent is it? Five and a half. Five and a half. So I think it takes real skill from a brewer Absolutely. to kind of mask that level of alcohol. Right. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. If you're drinking something that's 5.5 upwards, you, you normally get that little bit of the the booziness as it's going down. But I don't get that from the Stormy Port. I just get a smoothness that is familiar yeah. from a porter. Now, it, it's limited edition. Is it seasonal? Is it bottled? No, Stormy Port is, a, is a annual. It's, a it's, it's all the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But they did have okay. a special edition now, seasonal. Now, what happens, just out of curiosity, here when you have a limited edition beer that comes up? Because we've got, we've got a couple in the U.S. that... Um, are, are an interesting situation and, and I'd like to hear what you're drinking first Eric and then, then I'd like to just bring up something and see whether or not it's an issue in Ireland. Eric's actually gone for uh, like an Irish beer like the, the Irish beer itself the Red Ale yeah, just the Red Ale just the beer yeah but it's amazing I really like it it's one of my favourite favourite Red Ale's actually and um, 
they always work with it. That's it. You can always rely on it. It's, it's a nice beer after work. It's a nice beer at any time of the day. It's, it's good. It's just everyone everyone has that go-to beer, though. Yeah. You have to have a go-to beer because I know the first time I started drinking in this place, like I, you know, I've been dabbling in craft beer for a few years, but really got into it in a serious way last year. Well, I always found the big intimidation when you come in into a place and they've got 20 different beers on tap, and you're there going, "What the hell do I drink?" And the barman comes over and says, "What do you want?" And you're like, "I don't know." Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Try, try being a girl. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and you and know. And it's like, okay, are you in the wrong place? Are you looking for a place to go shopping? Are you looking for a mojito? Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah. But I was, I was going to say, um, what we've got in the U.S. in some cases is limited edition, one-off, very limited release beers. And, and one that comes to mind is from Tampa that you may or may not have heard of from Cigar City Brewing. And I'm going to pronounce it wrong. Um, Hanapu, Hanapu Day. We have a Imperial Stout that was released once a year. And what happened with it is it was limited release it, and it was getting very, very, very high ratings on rate beer, like 97 to 100. And people were starting to hoard it. So they would buy it, and they would immediately run out and try and sell it. They would buy it for $20 a bottle. And Cigar City was wonderful in terms of that. And people would try and sell it on eBay for $80 to $100. So it became a commodity. <laughs> Do you have that issue here? Well, that actually happened with 200 pounds. The bottles came in to Bulldog and a couple of the other uh, Galway Bay clubs. And people were in and got them. And then you found people were sending messages to other people going, Hey, I know you've got a whole stash of these. Will you sell me a bottle for 20 euros? And so that, like, this has actually happened. Right, um, and so if this does happen, like I noticed this as well with some of the other more limited edition beers that are foreign beers that are compatible, tactical nuclear pendulum or brood on it, but there's a premium of both for the beer cost. That was like a beer, was like 32 percent alcohol. It was like an ice block basically where yeah. it was done. And that came in at around uh, I think it's about 40 euros a bottle, but I know people who paid like 80 euros a bottle for that. Sink Bismarck was about 70 euros a bottle, which is like hard for IPA, still right the way down. So it's like really, really intense, very bitter, very hoppy. And that was like about 70 euros. I've seen people pay 100 euros a bottle. I mean, I paid 90 for that. I you know, I, I, I find it fascinating that Ireland has such a innovative, I think young, inventive sort of history and actually what you're going forward with, like compared to other countries. And, and I'm surprised at the fact that Italy's winning awards with beer because Italy was Moretto and that, or Moretti and that was about it. But to, to, to see Ireland actually going on the map with craft beer, and you're almost a little known secret because people think of Guinness. When you think of Ireland, they think of Guinness or Smittix, and more and more it's some of the Cascales, the really, really high quality, high powered. This is a case of where we're at this point in time where we're buying local foods, we're supporting local food producers. We're now not interested in going to high ends and uh, franchise restaurants. We want to go local, we want to support local. And brewery thing just feeds into that. The only problem is our legislation needs to catch up with it. And I'm sure it will, it's going to have to. Um, who, who, tried it, who tried to catch up with it and went wrong? I hope it won't go wrong with beer. I mean, um, through all that rediscovering actually Irish cuisine and Irish cooking, the law and food just went completely wrong. It screwed everyone over, every local producer, everyone trying to do things again. They have been done years and years and years ago. It even screwed the cheese, cheese industry over. Um, I hope it won't happen to beer. Um, and you know, and one of the ways that it may that's happen... That's the devil in Europe we call Hassan. One, one of the I, ways do, I, do, I do think that that is probably a good time to take a break because we're at the 15 minutes now. Um,